general and then LinkedIn 101 in general too. So I'm really excited to be tag teaming this with Kristen. I think together we'll be able to share a good amount of information. Awesome, well, we'll go ahead and get started. So we're gonna start off talking about the resume. And I don't want to assume that we all have a really clear picture of what that is. Um, but if I were to put it in a, a term, your resume is essentially your ticket into the interview. So I'm gonna start off with a question for you. And the question is, how long do you think you have to an over an employer with your resume? And so go ahead, if you wanna put it in the chat, either some minutes, however long you think you have to an over an employer with your resume. I'm gonna give you some time and as you're doing that, keep in mind if you do have questions, please, please, please utilize the chat and write them in. Uh, we'll be answering them kind of throughout the time, but especially we're gonna have a Q&A at the end. Okay, so I, had, I see some answers come in, 30 seconds, I saw two to three minutes. Okay, go ahead, Kristen, we'll do the big review. So studies show you have six to 10 seconds to win over an employer with a piece of paper. And this is honestly a huge, huge reason why career development is so key. Um, if you think about it, you spend some odd years in education, and then you spend some years um, either volunteering, getting clinical hours, and then now you have to have all of your experience kind of culminate into one to two pages. And ultimately, employers often know within six to 10 seconds if they wanna move forward with you or not. So let that kind of sink in and we're gonna dive in and kind of highlight what it looks like to build a strong resume. And as we go through, um, Kristen is going to highlight again some really industry specific um, you know, factors to keep in mind when you're building it, especially when we go through the examples. So here's just kind of a skeleton of what you wanna consider when you're building your resume, okay? So if you're thinking about it from maybe like top to bottom, obviously you need a header. We need to know who you are. We need to know where you're from. So that's gonna be some key information. We need to know your educational background, right? So what do you bring to the table? Um, Overall experience, we'll do a bigger deep dive into that um, in the next slide. Um, but that could be work, volunteer, or clinical experience. Um, I do wanna pause. Is everyone seeing the PowerPoint okay? Thumbs up, okay, great. Um, okay, and then after that, you could also include technical skills. This is going to be a huge one that you want to include. This really separates your resume from just being standard to specialized. And in addition to that, if you speak any other languages, we do want to be able to identify that, and then as well as certification. So um, I think it's best if we continue to move forward and kind of get a visual of what this could look like, practically speaking. Okay. So again, as we go through, feel free to put any questions you may have in the chat. Um, but here is a first sample resume. And again, Kristen, please feel free to chime in. I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the skeleton of each area. So I'm gonna start from the top, okay? So at the top, we do have your header, like I mentioned. So we have name and then note we have credentials. So actually I'm gonna go straight to you, Kristen, on here. What can you kind of share with this? Yes. So these are actually straight from the ASRT. We have two examples of resumes um, directly from the ASRT website. You can find those kind of in the student section. So at the top, when you're putting your credentials, you want your credentials to mirror exactly what the credentials on your certificate are or your licensure, whatever credentials you have, you want them to be exact. The reason for this is for recruiters. If a recruiter has a job come up for a rad tech, what they'll do is they'll look at the requirements, they'll copy and paste those credential requirements, and then they'll put them into like a LinkedIn search or a search engine. So if you have RT and they're searching for R period T period, you may not show up in their search. 
So you want to make sure that your credentials are always exactly the way that they would be found like on your actual licensure or credential or um, a degree in this case. Um, and you want to highlight those right away in the header because most likely the jobs that you're gonna be looking for are the ones that absolutely require those credentials. Awesome, thank you so much. So in addition to that, you'll note at the top right, um, we have a full address there. Um, actually, it's more notable that you'd want to lean more on just city and state instead of a full address. And that's really a couple things at play. Um, one, we're not doing so much of the paper transmission as much. A lot of things are digital, and so that's actually a privacy um, kind of courtesy that now employers aren't necessarily anticipating a full address, but you definitely still want to put a location city and state at the least. Um, make sure to have a number that is that will make you reachable, um, and then as well as a professional email. And so here I would advise to stay away from uh, a school email. You know, you want something that's long lasting. And you want something that will actually communicate something beyond you being a student, but actually being a professional. So that really does kind of go into the category of starting to own, you know, your credentials, starting to own your career path. So just be sure to put a professional email, okay? Under that, you will see a career summary. And um, I apologize, apologize if it's a little blurry, I'll go ahead and read it. It says, motivated and personable radiologic technologist with two years of experience who is committed to providing high quality radiologic services and meeting patients' needs during exam. And it goes on to kind of go a little bit more into certifications. For the sake of time, here's some things to consider about a summary. It's not required. And I honestly, I will kind of just put an asterisk here with everything I'm saying. These are really standards and a lot of times expectations, but know that you kind of have some leeway in how you build your resume. And we'll kind of hit on that a little bit later. But if you are gonna have a summary, you wanna make sure a few things are happening. One, it's succinct. So notice this isn't a full essay, right? This isn't a cover letter. If you're, if you're familiar with those, those are multiple paragraphs. These are really like two to three statements max. Um, they're starting off with what we call power verbs. And I want you to remember that. Motivated right? That is a strong word. It doesn't start with a personal pronoun, like I, me, my, we're going straight into the verb that really does highlight what you are doing, because that's going to really stand out. Um, it's highlighting really specific technological ability, and it's numerical, right? Two years of experience. So kind of keep that in mind when you're thinking of building a summary. Um, this will translate just really into LinkedIn and any other written kind of summary you're building. Um, to keep going, uh, accomplishments. So those are just a couple bullet points there. We see um, class presidents. So for all of you who are, who are involved beyond your classes, I also wanna pause and say, well done, I applaud you. Um, you already are a step ahead, right? I would want you to acknowledge that. But beyond it just being what you're doing, you need to make sure it's on your resume. Because, right, we might all have the same credentials. So it's gonna start mattering those really specific details that help you stand out, right? To make sure that if you're class president, put that on there. If you are, um, you won an award, put that on there. You graduated with honors, put that on there. Especially if you have, we'd say over a 3.5 GPA. Hey, that's notable. Not everyone graduates with that GPA. And so that is an ideal place to put it toward the top. Um, skills and abilities, Kristen, I, I'd love to kind of pass this off to you. And with a question, what skills and abilities do you think are really crucial to include on your resume? So the number of clinical hours that you completed, um, it used to be that all programs kind of did the same amount and some programs go way beyond that. So the number of clinical hours, the patient population that you have served. So if you have worked with a diverse patient population, let's say in Los Angeles, you would wanna put that on there. You wanna talk about the different age groups that you've worked with. So if you have extensive pediatric experience or geriatric experience, those, those groups of people that usually have a different type of imaging that's needed, then you would wanna highlight that. 
Um, this is also a really good place to say if you got to do any rotations in a different modality besides what you became certified in. So if you received cross training in CT or MRI, or you got to do some shadowing in those areas, you want to highlight those as well. So keep in mind that you are likely going to be applying for the same jobs as many of your classmates. So anything that sets, and usually at the same time, anything that sets you apart, anything that you did above and beyond your classmates, that would, um, that would be where you want to highlight it. Um, you can also, if you, um, if you did anything leadership wise, if you did anything that was like an elected position, if you volunteered, let's say you worked on a research project with one of your professors, that would also be really valuable here. Um, one of the other things that you could put is the machines or the type of equipment that you worked on. So this could be something like PAX. This could be something like um, Fuji. So let's say your particular facility has Fuji, Siemens, and GE. So if somebody has a facility that's all GE and they have three resumes that are all very comparable, it may be that the person that actually put GE on the application is the one that might be a better fit for the department just because it requires less training on the employer side. So anything that you did in your clinical, this is where you would want to highlight it and you just want to be concise in that as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I, I think one takeaway I hear and what I'd want to reiterate is details matter, right? Putting those little things can really help you stand out. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to keep going. So obviously you would want to put your clinical experience um, I do want to note the order of which you want to list information on your resume. You do want it, be, want it to be the most recent to the least recent. So you'll note that it says 810 to 611, and then be below that, um, we have a clinical rotation back from 09 to 10. And so just make sure that an employer, if they're picking it up, and remember, I have six to 10 seconds to be wooed. Um, I could quickly and easily read through your experiences and be able to identify what you did. And here's what, you know, I want you to put on that hat of an employer and anticipate what is something that maybe I don't want to see, right? So for me, maybe I, I don't want to see too much repetition of the same thing. So if I copied and paste, pasted those three bullet points from my first clinical rotation, I just put it in every clinical rotation because I'm like, hey, it was pretty similar. I pretty much did the same things. Um, you're really going to hurt yourself in the long run because what they wanna be able to see is you developing skills over time, right? Being able to activate what you've learned in the classroom and really being able to now, in your own words, clarify why you are qualified to do the work. And so one thing I love about this is um, I see a difference between the two different um, clinical rotations. Yes, the word assisted in is utilized many times. Again, from my career counselor standpoint, we would say avoid that, but that's not such a black and white issue. Sometimes they want to see that exact wording. And so that's where I would always make sure that you're, you're talking to um, your professors, people in the profession to clarify what is it that the application tracking system, right? Maybe a system that's literally looking for exact words um, wants to see. So assisted in portable intensive care imaging could be exactly what is needed. Um, one thing people wonder is do I need a put period? Do I keep it out? What's kind of the, the standard there? And really the standard is consistency. So just make sure if you're gonna put a period in one, you put a period after every bullet point that you have. Um, that is going to be critical, again, as far as details mattering. Um, and then beyond that, one thing I want you to note is they are in bullet point format. So remember those power verbs I, I mentioned earlier? Each of these bullet points are starting with those. So none of them start with, I did this, or I assisted, I did this, right? They're starting off with the strong verb to really clarify what you've done. And I can't stress that enough um, to get creative, but also to make sure that the word choice that you're using really does translate into your field, right? It's something as simple as um, substituting helped with assisted. Right. 
you can kind of hear that there's just a different connotation there. And you might be like, when's here really? Does that really matter? And I would say, yes, that's again, where the details start to matter a lot. I'm gonna keep moving forward because a lot of that key information is gonna stay the same, right? The bullet points, how you're forming them, and you'll see that happening here. If I hop down to professional experience, I'm now seeing the bullet points. I'm seeing prepared and positioned patients. I'm seeing created quality assurance program, assisted with, right? But now I'm gonna build upon it and I want you to think about what else are you now seeing? We're seeing a little bit more elaboration on the task at hand. And this is where we call them accomplishment statements, right? These bullet points are accomplishment statements. They're not just saying, I did this. Now they're saying, I did this to do this, or I did this which related to this, right? Created quality assurance program to reduce patient falls. And I can't tell you how many times when I'm reviewing resumes, I see the same front end of a statement from people who study the same major, right? Because you're learning the same things. And then out of nowhere, someone comes with a resume where they say, I did this to do this, or I did this, which resulted in 90% increase of X, Y, and Z. And guess who I'm more impressed with, right? The person who can clearly state what they've accomplished. So I would definitely encourage, don't get too caught up in just listing kind of the, the main task in and of itself. You need to be able to storytell, right, in the, in the line or two, exactly about what you did there. Um, so that kind of goes on to the second page. We go into education. Um, I wanted to pause, Kristen, is there anything else you would add to education or professional experience? So I want to highlight here that your clinical hours are experience. I wouldn't call it work experience just because the kind of connotation of work is that you got paid. Um, however, it is experience. And if you are going into an entry level position as a radiologic technologist, that is your most important experience, even more so than maybe your management or your food service or whatever job kind of got you through school. So the way that you do that is you are an intern. You are an unpaid intern as a student. So you want to make sure that it is clear that you weren't a working technologist in that role, but that you did get clinical time. So what I would, the, the titles that I would use for your clinical hours would be like student radiologic technologist or radiologic technology student or um, radiologic technology intern. You can say radiology intern, medical imaging intern. And then the title, an internship is a lot more professional. Um, and, it, and it shows that it was most likely not a paid work experience. Um, so you just want to be clear with that. You don't want to, um, you don't want to downplay your clinical experience. And then this is where you would, again, highlight if you did anything specifically different than every other person applying. So if you um, performed special procedures, you would want to put that in there. If you are proficient in portables on a pediatric unit, you would want to put something about that in there with those action verbs and those modifiers at the end of the statement. Now, thanks for mentioning that. And that, that does remind me, even as far as the order of your bullet points, you want to be intentional with that too. So I would, I'll, I would always say for your first bullet point, make sure that it's the most relevant to the job that you're applying for. And also something that really shows as much as you can leadership and accomplishment, right? Really think about those two categories, leadership and accomplishment. Um, okay, I'm going to keep going. Note the technical skills, computer skills, right? Note education. And I would just make sure to Kristen's point too, that you're writing it as exactly as it should be. Um, no typos. Something that I see, I've seen a lot um, in doing career counseling is the typo in their degree. And, you know, you work so hard to get it, just make sure to spell it right. Right, make sure the abbreviations are looking the right way, but also note that there's not abbreviations in the education section. 
here's where we would say own your degree and spell it out in full. So don't do BS or MS or try to spell it out, or I would say be sure to, um, and, and write the, clearly your date that you received it. Um, if you are in progress, make sure that's noted, but make sure that your resume is up to date whenever you are graduated. As soon as you're done and you can uh, list that, make sure that's up to date. Um, and then, of course, the awards and the licensures are also at the bottom of that second page. Those are critical. Um, before we move on, Kristen, would you add anything to licensure certifications? Yeah, so just make sure that you put exactly how it is on your certificate. Just make sure that that goes in there. Um, make sure that if you if you change your name between certification and applying for a job. So let's say that you get married right after school and your maiden name is on your certificate, but your married name is what you are legally now, and maybe you're starting to apply for jobs. You can put your um, maiden name in parentheses between your first and your new last name. Um, just so because when they check this licensure and certification, it's important to put your number on there too. They'll go online and check it on the ART website, or in our case, they're going to go to the CDPH website to check your license to make sure that it's valid. You want to make sure that the name that is on your license corresponds to the name that's on your resume. And so if they don't, if you've put your maiden name in parentheses in between the two, that will kind of help clear up that confusion. Um, it's so usually what they're looking for um, in radiology is we want to know what year did you get your original certification? Um, when does it expire? And then what is the number so that we can verify it? Um, so this is everything that might be required for a position. So when you're looking at the job description and they say you need CPR, BLS for healthcare providers, you want to make sure that if it's a requirement on the job pos um, position, then it is included in your resume. So your CPR, your venipuncture certificate, your ARRT, and your California license. You'll need all of those to work in a hospital in California. So just make sure that you put all of those there and you include the original certification date, the expiration date, and if there is an ID number on it. Awesome, thank you. And lastly, I did wanna note um, you'll, you'll see that the professional experience that you may have that's separate from the actual, um, from your actual career path. Let's say you spend some time maybe working at a restaurant, right? And maybe that doesn't necessarily relate. Um, note that it, they're still listed on the resume, right? But also note the position of it. That is not going to be the first thing that is listed on your resume. Um, you, we want to make sure that if I'm reading it in six to 10 seconds, I'm really probably uh, scheming through it, but I want it to be most relevant to least relevant as well. So I would just tag that closer to the second, maybe toward the bottom part um, of your actual resume, okay? And as you can see, when I clicked just now, it started opening up the website. We put these as clickable links in the PowerPoint and we'll make the PowerPoint available to you as well. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Good. I did want to ask you, Kristen, so we have a sample that's chronological, one's functional. Can you kind of speak to the value of either of those? Yeah, so chronological is really going to tell a, a timeline, like in what order that it happened, whereas a functional resume is a little more malleable to fit maybe the job that you're applying for. So in this one, what it's gonna do is it's gonna highlight your experience first and then your actual work experience later. So what this does is if they wanna know what type of skills you've acquired, what type of qualifications that you have, it's right up front. So there's not really a preference either way. I would say that whenever I'm choosing kind of what type of resume I do or even CV, I'm really going to be looking for the audience that's reading that. So if it's um, a recruiter from a healthcare agency, a lot of times those are not necessarily in healthcare. So I want to make sure that I'm highlighting all the skills they're looking for in the job description right up front. If I'm applying directly to a radiology director who knows 
all of the certifications that are needed. I'm going to highlight different things up front. I'm going to highlight my professional accolades or maybe the awards or scholarships that I received because that's what sets me apart. So really play to the audience of who's reading it. That's good. And I did see a question come in. Um, what about previous careers? And that's a really good question. I'll answer it briefly. Yes, you absolutely can list that. Similar to what I mentioned with the waitress job, right? Here, there's an example where there's not necessarily accomplishment statements listing everything that you did, right? We don't need that section to be as robust as we really need your clinical experience and that really um, relevant experience. However, if you choose to do maybe one bullet point, here's again what you want to keep in mind, leadership, accomplishment, but it needs, it needs to talk to your audience, which is a recruiter for your specific career. And so that being said, what you don't want to do is say, you know, I worked a cash register at, you know, Popeyes. Let's just say that. Hey, if you did that, great, but let's frame it in a way that makes sense. Okay. So maybe you're saying utilize technical ability to manage, um, you know, monetary transactions from X amount to this amount. That changes your, your task, right? That black and white task tremendously, but here's also what we're talking about now. Technicality, is it the exact same? No, but you're, you're being able to frame it into the job. And then also you're, if you maybe share a large amount of cash that you've handled, that also can show that you can be entrusted with much responsibility. So you can, again, get creative there. I wouldn't spend all your time though building those types of statements. Focus, focus, focus on what you need to, but you can get creative if maybe you have minimal experience in your field, right? And so you do want to add what you've done. Yes, I say own that, take pride. Let's make sure that it really is speaking to the career though. Yeah, I'm going to add to that a little bit. Yeah. So, um, so if you have skills that translate, so I, I think that everybody should work in food service at some point. And it's funny because I had Popeye's for dinner. So I'm like, you're like oh, reading my mind. I'm a so, <laughs> <laughs> so if you've worked in the food service industry, <coughs> excuse me, you're probably very good at managing a lot of tasks at once mm -hmm. and being able to be friendly at the same time. So when you're listing out, excuse me, <coughs> I must have got too excited. So when you're listing out those skills, you want to apply those skills to how it would translate to radiology. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I've learned from Valencia is point evidence value. Mm -hmm. So in these statements, you're going to make your point. You're going to provide evidence, some measurable thing. And then you're going to tell that company what value that particular task adds to their team. So let's say you're, a, a, you're in food service. I was a, a, a server in college. So I'm going to say um, managed um, customer relations over a six hour period to achieve this particular goal, right? So that's fairly broad, but it is specific. I made my point, I provided my evidence, and now I'm gonna show you how that translates to the service environment that is healthcare, because it's still customer service. We can all choose where we go to um, obtain healthcare, and we have inside customers and outside customers. Mm -hmm. So, just it's not that all experience is not valuable, because it is. You do want to pick and choose if you're going to list other jobs that have nothing to do with medical imaging. You just want to choose the ones that have transferable skills mm -hmm. to medical imaging. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. That's great. Mm -hmm. Good. I think we're wrapping up resume. There's just some final touches and we'll breeze through them. Aim for one page, not a deal breaker. You can do two. This is again, just kind of standards. Be honest. Don't stretch the truth, right? Make sure that we're clearly stating something that we could then explain in an interview. Proofread and edit, that's going to be key. Have someone else read it, read it out loud, multiple eyes on it. I would also add here Grammarly. So while you're still a student, create your account with Grammarly. Oh, yeah. um, it's 
very good and it does work for resumes. So I use it for everything. They now have a browser extension that you can add on. So it checks so my amazing. emails, my Word documents, everything. Um, use industry specific verbiage, kind of what we talked about too, even in the less relevant roles. And I would say simple things just as much as when we're talking to a patient, we're probably going to go with the more broad known term of CAT scan, but that's not what we call it in medical imaging. It's the axial, the A has been taken out of it. So you really want to put CT versus CAT scan. You want to say nuclear medicine instead of nuke med or isotopes. Good. Yeah. Adjust resume for each job application. So a lot of times when I'm working with people, they're like, I'm not getting any traction with my application process. What else can I do? And one of the first things I ask is, are you editing each resume that you're submitting to your jobs? A lot of times the answer is no. And the why is, well, I don't have time. That's a lot of work. It's pretty much the same thing. There's some slight differences, but I'm telling you, that makes a huge difference when you're tailoring your, your verbiage, um, the order, again, of those bullet points to really be in line with each application that you're applying for. Um, so make sure that you're really adjusting that accordingly, because if you're just doing a standard resume, it's not going to stand out. I, I, I guarantee you. Um, someone who spent the time to research that hospital or that clinic to be able to embed that mission and vision that they're talking about into their bullet points and make them come alive in that way is going to stand out way more. And let's say maybe your resume does get you the ticket into the interview. If you're neck and neck with the candidate, they're going to go back to that resume, right? They're going to try to find something that will um, help them distinguish who is a better fit. And so you want to make sure that you're really adjusting that. Um, demonstrate accomplishments. We've talked about that a lot. Um, listing references. So we do recommend putting that on a separate paper um, or a separate page. Reason being, you want to leave your room for your accomplishments and your certifications and your education. So making sure that you have the references listed, but they're not taking up space on your resume. Um, yes, Michelle, this is a great point. Um, making sure that you know, you're looking at the job description to update your summary and your key bullet points to have the exact keywords. And um, some people do, you know, worry, is that plagiarism? Again, in these, in these situations, if you can include those key phrases, but then include your accomplishments specifically that are, you know, really reflecting you, that's going to be the perfect place to be, okay? And then keep the format consistent and reader friendly. Um, note that the resumes that we looked at, they were clean, they were easy to read and, and kind of scan through in six to 10 seconds. If your resume is um, really wordy, it's, it's six pages long, you're already gonna start um, the reader off on the bad foot. So just making sure it's consistent and reader friendly. Okay, so we have some time, good. We're gonna dive into LinkedIn. LinkedIn is really important. We're gonna save the rest of the questions um, for the, the Q&A at the end for who can kind of stick around. Uh, but we're gonna dive into LinkedIn. So um, if you're curious, what is LinkedIn? Just to do a brief intro, this is essentially a professional social media. That's a very simple way to say it, but it has so many functions. You're, you're building your professional presence and profile you are adding your resume, your accomplishments, but you're also networking. And that's a huge component of LinkedIn. So here's some statistics for you. Um, 850 million plus LinkedIn users. Um, so this is global phenomenon and it's growing more and more, especially in this digitalized age. So it's essential that you build a profile, I would say, especially before graduating, ideally, um, but if not, as soon as possible. Um, over 58 million companies use LinkedIn and six people get hired off LinkedIn every minute. That's, that's every minute, <laughs> six people get hired. Um, over 60% of users are um, between the ages 25 to 34. So maybe you're kind of in that um, age range. There's a lot of people in your age population there. Um, and half of all American college graduates use LinkedIn. And then lastly, 40 million people use LinkedIn to search for jobs every week. So again, this is a really robust site 
And um, here's how to build a strong profile. Again, I'm gonna briefly go through this because I do think the value comes from actually looking at a profile, which we'll do shortly. So you're gonna add a profile photo, background photo. There is an about me section. So this is another summary opportunity, but this is your time to really deep dive more than you would in the resume. And we'll talk about that later. And then your standard information, again, that we kind of just went over in the resume, right? Education, experience, licenses, certifications, um, volunteer work, if you're affiliated, right, with any organizations or societies, um, ensuring that you're listing them, and then interests and skills and endorsements. So if you're really familiar with LinkedIn, all of that, you might just be like, yeah, yep, I know. If you have no idea, you're like, you just said a bunch of words, I don't know what you're talking about, that is okay. Um, I'm a visual learner, so you may be like me. We're gonna go ahead and look at um, an actual profile. So um, Kristen, do you mind kind of maybe doing yep. a brief intro on why this one was selected? Yes, so this is Nick. He is a technologist who graduated last year, got hired at his clinical site, and then managed to land a job in interventional radiology at Cedar sinai a world-renowned hospital with less than a year of experience, and none of it was in interventional. So he went from being a diagnostic entry-level technologist to an interventional radiologic technologist in LA in less than a year. So he capitalized on LinkedIn to build his network. So he was in the class that Valencia came and did this to last year at um, where I work. And so in our last semester, we, we work on radiography review prep for the ART, and we also do a ton of this type of stuff, so getting ready to graduate. So all of my students have to make a LinkedIn during that time. Start to finish, we'll even do it in class sometimes. It's about 10 minutes to get the important stuff. Mm -hmm. So the things I want to highlight about Nick's profile is that his background cover photo is a medical imaging photo. It's just stock, but right away, I know that he knows something about medical imaging. So if I'm looking for a technologist and I've got five pages and this one has a C-arm setup, then um, that sets him apart. He has a nice professional headshot. Um, then he has, he doesn't even have the about me section, but the about me section is really important just to give a little bit of information about yourself. And it's kind of highlighting the, your biggest accomplishments. Um, then below that, and he's not super, so activity is gonna show what you posted, if you liked anything. He's not super active in, um, in posting things, but he still logs in, he still makes connections and um, uses it to his advantage. Mm -hmm. Then he's got his experience with his most recent first so, um, and he made sure that he chose the verified employer. So instead of just typing in Cedar sinai he typed it in, it searches it, and then it will show you if that employer has a LinkedIn page. So because it does, if I were to go click on Cedar sinai it would take me to their page. So it shows that he's got that professional affiliation. Before that, he has working as a technologist and then the student role. So this is how he put his clinical hours under the employment. So it's radiologic technologist student. Um, and then education. He's got all of his licenses and certification and then the skills. The skills are super helpful when you're looking for something particular. So if you had any leadership, people can endorse you. So let's say that he worked at conferences and events, and I was the advisor for that particular program, then I could go endorse him for those leadership skills. I'm basically vouching for him. And somebody with good connections or well-respected in the field vouching for you goes a very long way. So he's got some endorsements from people. Um, so you can see that this probably did not take a whole lot of time, but it has served him very, very well. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. You actually mind going back to his profile. There's a couple of sure. things. Yep. 
I want to hit on with LinkedIn. So, you know, we highlighted kind of the stellar basis of LinkedIn, but really where it becomes powerful, and I think there's a few people on the line that can really speak to this, it's really when you activate your profile. So it's really not enough. You know, a lot of people, especially if they're required to do it for class, ask, can I just copy and paste my resume? Like just done deal, kind of, it's the same thing. And this is where I say no, no. And the reason why is it's really easy to scout someone who maybe just did it because they needed to and someone who actually built a personal brand. Now you may be maybe like me and you're sitting there like, let's see, I'm not trying to be an influencer. Like, I don't even know branding. Like I'm, I'm just trying to do my career. And I want to encourage you um, when I get that. But two, it's not just building this false persona. It's actually letting employers, it's letting your colleagues, your future colleagues kind of in on who you are. And so not in any way am I encouraging you to be someone you're not, but it's really amplifying what you've done, what you're interested in and, and who you are, right? So if I go on your profile and I do look at the things that you like, let's say you're not even posting. Let me look at the things you like right, literally are engaging in. If it's it's showing kind of similar interests, it's really aligning with the career, or maybe I'm seeing you're engaging with my own hospital and you're already showing commitment to what we're doing, then I'm seeing that you as a professional are not just interested in the general profession, you're actually keying in on what we're doing here, right? So let's say that um, right here, we see Cedar sinai ranked number two hospital in the nation. He says, proud to be working at this organization. Congrats, Cedar sinai See how simple that is, right? He's not writing anything really robust, but it's powerful. He, he's identifying with his organization. He's also um, being able to identify the accomplishment of it. And so let's say in a, some years, maybe he's wanting to transition elsewhere. And we're seeing, wow, he worked at a notable hospital in the nation. I want to learn more about this person. So that's where you really want to identify what you can do on LinkedIn. That's why I want to point you to the top. So if you look at the top, you'll see a few different options, right? So we could go home and home is essentially your feed. So just like, let's say your Instagram, you can scroll through this feed and it's going to show people that you follow or people who follow you, things that they've liked, things that they've posted. And at the base level, if you're a new person to LinkedIn, this is where I would get used to just liking content, right? Stacy Gonzalez liked this post and now she's visible on my feed. So, you know, there's this statistic that um, only like 16% of people log into LinkedIn daily. Now we just saw millions and millions and millions of people are on it, but only 16% log in daily. That will help you leverage yourself beyond people so much more. And sometimes it's just as simple as liking content, right? But then at the top, you can see where it says share a post. Um, for LinkedIn, photos do gain more attention. Um, and so if that's the route you're trying to take, right, become more visible, um, build connections, be more seen. I would try to post or repost photos, relevant photos, relevant videos. And Kristen, I'll have you kind of talk about uh, what to not post. Um, but that's going to be a really key feature. And I would just try it on, right? Maybe like for a month, you're just liking content. And then maybe by month two, you're like, hey, I want to dive into this a little bit more. I'm going to repost something. And I'm going to say, hey, I'm proud to be working here. Or look at this amazing um, new addition to X, Y, and Z, right? Um, so this is powerful. Then you have the My Network tab. And you might notice if um, you saw his um, profile, he had over 500 connections. And LinkedIn is all about connections. You can have a, a spotless profile, but if you have two connections, even if you have like 50 connections, you can't expect to really leverage your profile well. And so what we tell students is aim for 300 to 500 by the time you graduate. And if you don't have that, just take a next step. But this is the tab that you wanna to go to. It's gonna actually kick out recommendations for you of people that go to your school, that study the same thing, that work at your same location. 
And then you, all you have to do is click connect, connect, connect. And this is where it is different than a social media, right? Maybe you have someone in your class and you're, maybe you're not that close. And so it would be a little weird to, to ask to follow them and see their personal life. But kind of the standard with LinkedIn is, and this is up to you, but let's say you're a classmate, they're your professor even, yes, family, um, maybe a notable speaker at a conference you went to, it is totally appropriate to request a connection with that individual because people are on LinkedIn to connect professionally with people. And so if you're wondering, okay, how do I get to 500 connections? You absolutely can get to 100 in a couple of weeks if you're spending some time on this My Network tab, right? Um, I'm gonna take a break here, Kristen. Can you kind of speak to either the posting or the, the My Network tab? Because I do think those are kind of the two key essentials of LinkedIn. Yeah, so whenever I go to a conference, especially if I really enjoy to talk, what I will do is I will find them on LinkedIn. Usually as I'm filling out the course survey, I'm finding them on LinkedIn, I'm asking to connect. And then if they agree to connect, then I send them a private message and just some type of gratitude. Hey, I enjoyed your talk at ASRT House of Delegates, you know, look forward to working with you or I'd love to connect or something like that. Anytime somebody connects, following up with a personalized message just has to be one sentence goes so far. And each connection opens you up to their network. So now every time that new connection likes something, you see what they liked. So a lot of the things that I follow or a lot of the posts that I look at are because one of my network shared it or something like that. Um, so as a student, how this is going to serve you is you should be looking for hospitals in your area, clinics in your area, anywhere you're interested in working you're gonna be looking for those connections, people who work there. Um, titles like director or manager or supervisor or even lead technologist, those are the ones that you want to uh, connect with. The reason for that is because when they get 17 applications, 17 resumes, and your name looks familiar, that is a, a fresh point of contact before they've ever met you. So it shows that you took an initiative to connect with them. It's kind of like the pre-work. You're doing work before the job to set yourself apart. As far as posts go, you definitely want to make sure that your posts are professional. This is not the place to talk about what you had for lunch unless that uh, plays into your professional life. This is not the place to advertise maybe your, your comedy TikTok. This is really the place to put on your professional image. This is your professional branding. So you definitely wouldn't want to put anything on there that you wouldn't show to your boss or, or anything like that. Um, I'll show you some of, I'll get a little bit vulnerable and I'll show you some of my posts. Um, the type of things that I post are like the CSRT today. Um, our provost gives us a theme each year and I was inspired by the theme and I wanted to see how other people might respond to that theme. Um, I started a new position at work. I shared that with my network. And you can see, um, it actually doesn't have the dates on here. Yeah, so five hours ago, 10 hours ago, one week ago, two weeks ago. I don't necessarily post all the time but I do go on LinkedIn every single day. So this is you advertising the things you're passionate about, the things that you're advocating for. Um, this is you being passionate about medical imaging. So some of the things that I follow, I follow GE, Siemens, Fuji, CareStream, which used to be Kodak, because I wanna know what's coming up and then every time I like one of those things, it's gonna show, oh, she's interested in this type of equipment or she's interested in this particular modality. So then again, when recruiters who are hiring people sometimes without ever even having met them. So my stepsister is a recruiter, she's fully remote. And what she taught me is a lot of times recruiters for the really good jobs, they're going to be looking on places like LinkedIn 
before they ever go on Indeed or they go check applications. So they're going to be looking for people rather than people coming to them looking for a job. This sets you apart by being that person that's looking for jobs before they come about. So it serves you the way you want it to serve you. The other thing that I would say will help you once you get your credentials is to put your credentials behind your name as part of your username, just because it pops up right away. And most of the, you'll see that most of the medical imaging community does that as well, because that right away, as soon as somebody looks at your profile, they're like, oh, she's a technologist because of the credentials. That's awesome. And I love that you mentioned recruiters. One of my favorite tabs is that jobs tab. You could click on that one. And this is huge. Um, you know, sometimes people don't realize they could literally be job searching on LinkedIn. It's not just to be a profile sitting there. Um, so take note of those tabs on the left-hand side. You can save jobs and apply later. You can actually set job alerts. So you can set specific um, qualifications of the types of jobs you're looking for. And LinkedIn, you know, it's attached to your email. So you might get an email um, for me or for people who are like, like being on LinkedIn, um, there's an app for it. And so I always encourage students, um, and this may not be you, but maybe it's really easy to kind of open Instagram and start scrolling. Maybe while you're in the, the trenches trying to find job, um, you replace that with the LinkedIn app and you start scrolling and you start saving jobs and you start applying um, because this is a really great tool to utilize. Some people, as far as soft skills go, they wanna be able to know how can I support these technical skills that all of my classmates and I have garnered? How can I kind of balance that with some key soft skills that are um, consistent to me, specific to me? There's a skills, a skills assessment that you can take. Um, and then there's other resources there and a lot of them are free. Um, some people ask, you know, there's LinkedIn premium. Do I need that to be successful on LinkedIn? And long story short, no, you don't need it. Um, I'll be honest, um, you know, it could cost up to 700 or more a year um, getting the premium for a job seeker. Now, there may be other options. For some people I know, maybe it's covered based off of a job you have, or, or maybe that you put, you, you budget in professional development. And so this actually is in line with your values and how you kind of budget. Again, that's kind of all in the individual decision-making station. For me though, what I always tell students is you can try premium on for free and why not, right? Um, with premium, you do get special access um, one thing that you might not know about LinkedIn is if you don't have premium and let's say you click on someone's profile, it actually notifies them that you looked at their profile. And for some people you're like, okay, that's a little weird. Like, especially if someone I don't know super well, but if you're trying to get strategic and maybe, um, you're prepping the message you're going to send to a new connect and you do want to do some research, maybe that kind of hidden mode that you get in premium is something that you're looking for to be able to do that a little bit more openly. Um, something to note too without premium is messaging is um, less, um, you can't message people you're not connected to without premium. Um, you have a certain amount of messages per month that you can use. And so you do kind of have to get creative if you're trying to message someone you're not connected to. However, again, the work around that is, um, and I think it was mentioned actually by you, Brandon, absolutely message someone before you're trying to connect. A lot of times you can attach it to your connect request, right? So you can absolutely be, um, you know, you can excel on LinkedIn without it, but if you, you can pay for it, I would just make sure you're using it, um, but it is really beneficial. Um, so that's kind of the point for, for premium. And I would encourage you to try it on for free once you're really deep diving into the job search Again, because why not? It will really be beneficial. Um, note at the top that there's keywords that you can utilize for your job searches too. It's really similar to Google. So it's actually really user-friendly. Um, so don't be intimidated by that, um, but make sure to use any keywords that you think um, can be relevant to the field because quite honestly, people miss out on job opportunities when they limit the words that they're using. Maybe it's radiology here and it says radiologist here. 
right? Something very slight, but can actually cause you to miss out on those jobs. Um, and then messaging, that's a feature as well as notifications. Um, so notifications will show you what other people are posting. Um, it'll show you if people got a new job, where people are working. And that's actually really helpful, um, especially if you know a college student, if you're about to graduate, if you're a new grad, or even just an alumni to kind of track where your colleagues are. And um, again, really easy way to start off on LinkedIn, congratulate them, right? Congratulations can go a long way. Maybe you include um, a note about what you appreciated about them or, or maybe just well wishes. Because here's the thing, that alone is networking, right? But that also is connected to you. If you would say you're someone who loves to celebrate successes, Right, for me, that's something that is just kind of me. Like I, I would love to celebrate people when they're moving forward, um, maybe even making transitions in their career. And I want them to be encouraged in that way. So that's actually a key part um, of what I do on LinkedIn. And that matters to me. And if someone were to look on my profile and see my activity, they'd see that that matters to me. But then beyond that, when maybe you're job searching, um, and you kind of took a mental note, okay, so-and-so is at the hospital that I kind of want to be at, then you message them, right? And it's all in this one website. Um, so I do want to move forward to lastly, and kind of speak toward the advocacy piece, because, um, you know, LinkedIn is truly amazing, but I want to make sure that we're, we're targeting it to you all in your career path. So, um, yeah, Kristen, can you kind of explain a little bit about either success story testimonial that you've experienced? Yeah, so I want to give three testimonials, three different situations. One was a student um, who got hired before they ever graduated or even became uh, licensed um, off of LinkedIn. So I had a student um, like Nick. He was the year before Nick. We built the LinkedIn in that, that spring semester. And he got contacted by a recruiter in another state in about March. And they said, hey, we're interested in hiring you for this cardiac cath lab position in Montana. So he said, okay, um, just to be clear, I'm still a student because um, it seemed that maybe they thought he was already a technologist. That's kind of the platinum of radiology is cardiac cath lab. So um, they kept in contact with him. They said, we'd love to fly you out for an interview. He got an interview and he kept coming to me like, is this what happens? And I was like, absolutely not. That is not how things happen. This is amazing. I've never heard of this. And I said, I would be interested to know like what made them want to interview you. I mean, with no experience um, outside of general diagnostic radiography. And they said that it was his LinkedIn. So he had an extremely professional LinkedIn. They happened to be looking for very specific skills. And when they typed in those skills to search, Joe's, um, Joe's thing came up. And now he's been working as a cardiac cath lab technologist in Montana and Colorado for three years ever since he graduated. So that's the kind of first testimonial. If you're a student and you're not sure how this serves you, let it be that. My second testimonial is the job that I currently have, I got because of LinkedIn. So I was in a position where I had been an adjunct faculty for a while. I was looking for a full-time professor role. And I saw that one of my LinkedIn connections that I had worked with for a very short amount of time, it showed up as somebody you may know. Just like it does on Facebook, it does the same thing on LinkedIn. And I said, oh, I wonder how he's doing. We worked together for about five weeks, about three years before that. So I go to his profile and it says program director at this school for radiologic sciences. And I said, they don't have a radiologic sciences program. So I sent him a message and I said, hey, how are you doing? I just wanted to check in and see. It looks like you're at CBU now. Are you running a program? And he said, yes. And so I said, you know, I'm, I'm an adjunct. I would love to work there. Um, please let me know if you have anything, right? So it took about a year of just contacting him once a month or so. And then ultimately, I was given an adjunct role there and then a full-time role the next year. So I wasn't necessarily looking for a job. I didn't apply to anything. It just showed up as somebody I knew and I realized that there was a new program. The last one is as a way to build your network. So 
Brandon, him and I, he contacted me on LinkedIn because I started getting more active. So our leadership at the school that I work for each year, they give us a one, one word vision for that year. Last year was connect. And I said, you know what? I'm going to start using these connections. I'm going to start touching back with people that I've worked with in the past and just kind of checking in and see how they're doing. My husband did a hundred coffee dates in a hundred days, and it was all through LinkedIn. So from seven to eight o'clock before he started work, he did virtual coffee sessions with LinkedIn connections from all over the country that he had never necessarily met before. So I kind of took that and ran with it. And Brandon contacted me. I saw him really active on LinkedIn. Then we became like LinkedIn friends celebrating each other. Every time I posted something new, he would say, oh, I really like that you did that or congrats on the lecture that you gave at so-and-so. So then this year when we met at House of Delegates, I already knew him and he knew me. So, and now is part of the reason he's here tonight and, and so I wanted to talk about using those connections for advocacy. So if you are passionate, I'm assuming that if you're here tonight, you're passionate about the CSRT, you're passionate about what it does for our profession, um, use LinkedIn to disseminate that information. So it's a very valuable tool to get the word out. So when AB 1273 passed last year, and now there's an earn to learn bill. The LinkedIn is where CSRT got the message out so that we could oppose that bill. Now it ended up passing, but we made a huge effort and reached so many more people just by LinkedIn. So Valencia brought up a great point. I am not really on Facebook anymore. And that kind of scrolling, that habit that I developed from being on my phone too much, now I just turn it into LinkedIn. So if I have a couple of minutes on my lunch break, instead of scrolling social media, which usually doesn't necessarily make me feel great, <laughs> I go on LinkedIn instead, and then I get to celebrate people, or I get to connect with people, or I get to use it in a way that serves me. So I, you know, when Valencia would come to my classes and speak to my students, I used to say like, don't look at my, don't look at my LinkedIn. I'm not looking for a job. It's not, it's not good right now. Right. So I, I'm still not looking for a job, <laughs> but I've started letting LinkedIn serve me in different ways. So it still sends me jobs that I might be interested in, but at least once a month, I get an email from a recruiter. And these are for the jobs that are sign-on bonuses, big companies, Dignity Health. I hear from Dignity Health at least once every three months. Now, whether I respond to those messages or not, or that they even serve me at the time because I'm not actively seeking employment, um, it, it kind of falls by the wayside because at least I have those options. So then later on, so um, I made a LinkedIn connection, which led to a podcast that podcast led to another lecture at a different affiliate. So it really snowballs really, really quickly. And right now what it's doing is it's giving me the connections that I need to refocus my time towards things that I really love, like advocacy. So um, it can serve you in a lot of different ways, whether you're actively seeking employment, not actively seeking employment, just looking to grow your network. Growing your network is so important, but then making sure that you're offering in that connection anything that you would be expecting in return, right? So if somebody were to just out of nowhere message you and say, hey, I see you work here. Um, I'm trying to get a job. Can you put a word in for me? I'm not going to do that, right? <laughs> but if somebody were to say, hey, I saw that, that talk you gave and I really enjoyed it, thanks. Then I'm gonna connect back with them. I'm gonna go back to their profile and then I'm gonna find something that's gonna help me remember them. So how you use it is really up to you, um, but it is an extremely valuable tool that can serve you really well when you know how to utilize it. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. I think testimonials go such a long way. And I think if you're listening and 
And I'm just gonna be real. Sometimes that's intimidating to hear. Like, I don't even know where to start. I'm not on LinkedIn anymore. So how, how do I get to an, a level where I can really activate my profile? And really what is powerful is just consistently taking small steps. Start with that connect, right? That my network tab, build connections, maybe kind of slowly, daily, um, but then also really kind of be thinking through as I'm identifying contacts, people who are ahead of me, right, in my career. Now, how can I activate that? A really practical way, let's say you're not looking for a job, is what we call informational interviews, is which exactly what she was talking about with those coffee chats, right? And it's asking, hey, you know, I'm so and so, I'm really interested in this career path. Do you mind if I just take X amount of time with you virtually, maybe if they're local? in person, um, just to ask a few questions, right? And, and building connections, that is active. But here's the thing, go at your pace, right? Because LinkedIn on the flip side can really hurt you. And what I mean by that is if you, okay, I'm gonna connect to a hundred people, I'm gonna message a hundred people and you follow up with two of them, right? Then now that also can stain your reputation. Right. So maybe you actually were really interested in this position here and this person is actually a hiring manager or higher up in this hospital, whatever it may be. And you had initially messaged them and maybe you kind of ghosted them or left them on red or you took a really long time to get back to them and then you apply for a job that actually is gonna hurt you probably way more than it will help you. So I definitely always encourage people pace yourself. If you can handle X amount connects at a time and message them at a time and really follow up, do it. But it's okay to really grow into that capacity. I'd argue most of us um, would probably say that was something that we needed to learn how to do, right? Um, so just for the sake of time, keep in mind that the LinkedIn and your resume should be different. Note there's a lot of similarities, but just to quickly identify the differences. LinkedIn, you have less space limitations, right? We had one to two pages with the resume. Here's your time to shine. Feel free to explain a little bit more. Feel free to use paragraph format. Um, also feel free to use those personal pronouns and make it a little bit more personable and um, expand upon what you're already talking about on your resume. And then of course, strategically use it to communicate. While your resume, again, is gonna be your ticket into the interview. So here's where we do wanna be a little bit more structured, be more concise, um, but still explain your accomplishments, right? Not just your tasks, but your accomplishments. And really the goal here is um, on your resume, include your LinkedIn. And what will happen is if it's a, let's say it's digital and you can link actually your LinkedIn, and then they could just click it and learn more about you. Let's say you grab me in that six to 10 seconds and now I wanna learn more, I'm actually gonna to go to your LinkedIn. So here's the thing, if you put your LinkedIn on your resume, let's make sure it's active, let's make sure it's up to date and they'll actually learn more about you and it's not just gonna be a repeat of your resume, right? So I just want you to kind of keep that in mind as far as just even the sequence of events. Sometimes it's the reverse. I don't wanna make it seem like it's that black and white. Um, but again, if we're thinking about applying for a job, that oftentimes is the case. Okay, I'm interested in learning more about this candidate. Let me look at them on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, okay, how are we doing with time? I know we have a Q&A, but... Um, I do see a question in the chat from Michelle, and maybe Valencia, you might be able to answer it. Um, is it better to actually apply via the LinkedIn app or directly to the company? Is there a mm -hmm. difference? That's a good question. Um, I always encourage people, whenever you're applying, get to know the company. And so a lot of times you actually do need to research that per company. Um, and that's where I would utilize LinkedIn to identify who the connect is. If you see an active recruiter, oftentimes LinkedIn is a go. Go for that first, apply there. But if it is a question mark, I would actually get that information and then go to the strategy that actually fits that best. I've heard both ways. I've heard people who really are faithful to their application site um, and then use LinkedIn almost like, okay, I want to look at your profile. But then, and you'll, you'll get to know LinkedIn as you're on it. You'll see the ones that are actively posting are really active. Um, then you'd want to go via the LinkedIn application. And then the biggest thing overall is follow up. Apply and within a couple of weeks, 
follow up with the individual you know is ahead of that hiring process and um, be able to track, you know, if you, you, you don't hear back, um, then you, it's really on you to follow up with that. Um, so long story short, I would identify the best strategy for each application. At the end of the day, just be sure to follow up. All right, so there's some other ones. Um, Michelle asked, do you have a good online site or app to scan for keywords? So actually this is something my husband um, discovered this week. So in the newest updated word online, you type a document. So let's say you copy and paste the mission statement of the hospital you're applying to. And um, you can, there is a feature in there where you can make, it will make a PowerPoint for you. So this is AI at work again. It will make a PowerPoint for you and pull the key points out. So you can try that to see if it pulls out those key points of the mission statement or those key words. And I see Brandon's raising his hand. Do you have something to add to that? I was going to say, it's also important to know, uh, I don't know if it's premium or not, but depending on how well you strategically set up your profile with keyword searches, it will tell you how many uh, search results you are yielded in uh, right. within a certain period of time. So you can see if your uh, if your profile is 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 being yielded uh, in a lot of that stuff, which is helpful to know. Yes, yep. that's very true. And yeah, to that point, you don't need premium to see the statistics. Where you Correct. would need it is to reveal who looked at your uh, profile or who is identifying you. But I think the statistic has really been helpful for a lot of people just to see, am I gaining traction as I'm building connections, as I'm applying and things like that. So that, that's an excellent point. And they send you an email, I think it's on Sundays, that'll show how many times you showed up in searches. And then you, when you open it, it shows what jobs those people held that were searching you. So it'll show, you know, like professor or radiologic technologist. So yeah, that, and that is a non-premium feature. I know because I don't have premium and I have that. Yep. Let's see. Um, I know there's some more um, questions. So Brandon also brought up a great point. So it, ha it has the potential of granting you direct access to key decision mm -hmm. makers for hiring on different levels. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, can we give some helpful tips about how to write the about section, how to make it personal and draw people in? Yeah. Do you have anything on that, Valencia? I do, that's a great question. Um, this is where the branding comes into play. And to me, I'm a creative, so I'm like, ooh, that's exciting. For some people, they're like, oh, I don't wanna write words. This is why I'm in the whole field. <laughs> Um, and that's where I would say feel free to kind of collaborate with people. Sometimes you don't even know what your voice is, right? That can be like a really abstract um, phrase even. What I would say to avoid is again, copying and pasting your about section from your resume. Again, we need that succinct, we need that two to three statements. And that can be what's on LinkedIn. I've seen people thrive and have three statements, right? In their summary. What we'd recommend is think about a few different categories. Think about where you've been. So kind of give brief background. Think about where you're at and then where, you're, you, where you hope to go. And it really is a story in that way, right? Every story kind of has a beginning, middle, and an end. Now it doesn't need to be a full essay, so hopefully that's a relief. <laughs> but let's say you're trying to do one solid paragraph, right? Um, what I mean by voice is, I would actually say it out loud how you would in an interview. Um, get to know how you would actually verbalize this to someone and then write it down and edit, right? You don't necessarily need to start with, off with, my name is so-and-so, because we do see that. <laughs> um, you can if you want. Um, but maybe you start off with some type of hook, right? This is going, kind of going back to that like English 101, if you will. Um, Maybe you captivate them with having a background in, um, you know, let's say EMT and then also radiology. And, and maybe you're kind of starting off with, I, I have two different fields that I've done before, but then you're, you're going into what you bring to the table because of that. And I wanna highlight what you bring to the table. So it's not just, I got this degree and then now I'm studying this and now I hope to do this. It's saying, I got this degree where I gained skills in X, Y, and Z. 
having served X amount of years in this, that, and the other, have, I, I'm equipped to handle X, Y, and Z. And then maybe at the end, you're, you're talking a little bit more about what you're passionate about, right? You're bringing it home with the why you want to be in the field. And so that's just kind of an overall outline. Think of a story, beginning, middle, end, what you've done, what you're doing, where you hope to go. And the reason why I think that's helpful is, again, if we just see what's on your resume, we just see the degree that everyone else has had, then it doesn't really stand out. And the students that I've read, or even the alumni, the summaries that stand out to me are the ones that can really and clearly bring in soft skills, technical skills. And even if you're thinking, okay, how do I bring in this career that is vaguely relative to this, right? Well, maybe you bring in that one statement that really does help you sound different. I've gained 10 years in leadership, just, um, leadership experience in um, hospitality where I learned key professional skills of X, Y, and Z. And I bring that to the table in this way by X, Y, and Z, right? So um, what I would often tell people is start to look at other people's about section. Do not copy it, but read it. Right, of people that influence you, people that um, are setting the pace in the LinkedIn activity and see what they're doing in their about section. A lot of times you can still hear that voice when they're posting, you can read that voice when they're commenting. And so there's a lot of um, consistency there. And I see a question about, does volunteer experience on resume and LinkedIn need to be directly related to your future radiologic technologist mm. career? And I would say no. So volunteering is always going to look good, whether it's at your church or maybe it's in a sorority or maybe it's an organization like an animal shelter. All of those things are going to look good. And again, you're going to pull what skills did I learn mucking stalls at the horse boarding facility that translate to radiologic technology, right? So that's where you do maybe get a little creative, um, but absolutely put it on there. What I will say is when I first started, I listed all of my experience all mm. the way back to Hot Topic, right? Because I had like management experience from Hot Topic. As I get more years in the field, I'm listing less and less. Mm. So right now you're going to get a little creative, right? You're going to be listing your Del Taco job or your claim jumper job. You're going to be listing that. As you get more technologist roles, you can let those fall off. But right mm -hmm. now is the time that you do want to kind of be creative and add all, all of that volunteering. Before I forget this, because it just popped into my mind. So there was a question about where can we get a mentor? Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. LinkedIn is your place to find a mentor. Now, ASRT has a professional mentoring program in which professional mentors who volunteer for that will mentor you through that SLDP program. I am also an SLD program participant. I was part of the inaugural program class in 2011, and it has served me all the way up until this point. Um, so I highly, highly, highly recommend that. The CSRT is the one who gets to choose the two students from California. So um, we, are, we are a part of that. It is kind of locally managed in that way, which is really nice. Um, but this is a great way to find a mentor. So you find somebody that is aspirational to you. That's the path I want to take. I want to be doing X, Y, and Z. You connect with them. And then just like Brandon said, that message goes so far. And I will attest to this too. If somebody connects with me and then we just connect and then I never hear from them again, I will forget about that person by a very short term memory. <laughs> but if you connect with me and then just send a quick message, hi, Kristen, nice to meet you. That's it. That now your message stays in my message folder. So every time I open up my message, I say, oh, there's Valencia again. They're like, oh, I wonder how she's doing. And it's just another kind of touch point. And then over time, you start building that relationship and it turns into a mentorship. Um, other ways to find mentors is to um, approach your professors 
Brandon really hit on this too. Radiology is such a small world. Mm -hmm. There's about 350,000 registered technologists in the country. That's across all modalities. So it is a very, very small world. We all know each other and we all talk about it. (laughs) We all talk about medical imaging all the time. So who you know is extremely helpful making these connections while you're still in school and you have access to technologists at your clinical site your professors at your school, your student peers, making those connections now and just spending two minutes a day connecting with them. Hey, how's it going? How are you doing? How'd you do on that test? Um, That can, can really help you build your network. And then at some point, you may need to use that network. So you want to make sure that you're feeding into it what you are wanting in return. Yeah, Brandon, do you have something extra? Definitely. Don't don't let it intimidate you. Understand that this is just a different way to start a conversation. Sometimes we think about interacting online and it becomes such a such a grueling thing and it doesn't have to be. If you wouldn't be weird in person, don't be weird in an inbox. You know, I mean that's the that's the simplest advice you can give. And so when you talk about your network working, for instance, Kristen tells you about how we build our relationship, what has me. What well, made me conscious of the call, I think I saw a post either from Michelle or from Kristen. And then I have a very um, a very regular relationship with Dr. Kevin Clark. And Kevin Clark thinks so much of Kristen. And he's I like, oh, I'm that. going to speak to this. He is awesome. Don't tell him I said that, though. Don't <laughs> tell him I said that. And, and he made me reemphasize what was going on with the CSRT in the student program. And he said, you know, they're looking for people to speak. I was like, why? Why are they looking for people to speak? And he's like, what do you mean? I was like, it's some, a million people out there who will be. I said, oh, that's okay. I said, uh, he said, well, I'll send, I'll send, I'm going to send Christian your way. I said, no need. I'll come to her. But those are the things. And you you think it's so simple. One word I want you to put in your dictionary and then I, and I'll quit with all my hot air. <laughs> it's intention. When you really think about what you want to do intentionally, all this other stuff kind of falls into place because either it's aligned or it's not aligned. What do I need on my resume? How does it serve my intention? What do I need in my about? How does it serve my intention? What are the things that I post? Who am I trying to intentionally trying to be? And so that is really important. And to show you how it works, when I started really being active on LinkedIn, I had maybe 3,000 connections. And I think within a year, I'm I'm probably a couple of hundred away from 13,000. And and so it's just moving. But I also deal with LinkedIn every day. And so, because it works for the work I'm doing for you all and what I'd like to do. And then all kinds of people contact you. So that's, that's the caveat to the back end of that too. Now, it's going to be True. some great connections, and then it's going to man. It's, some of these people are strange, and so I'll leave it at that. And so you just learn how to be prudent with it, and know that it's more advantageous than it will be a burden. In my experience, and that's a great point. You know, we're laying it all out. These are the all the ways that we've used this, or we've seen this, or it serves us. And really, you pick and choose how you want it to serve you. But hopefully you've gotten an idea of all the different ways that it can serve you. Um, And yeah, don't let it intimidate you. It really is like a 10 minute getting your profile set up. And then, you know, whenever there's in the same thing with your resume, once you've got your draft, every time something happens, you have an achievement, you have an accomplishment, you publish something or you speak at something or you take on a new volunteer role. Just take five minutes that weekend when you have a chance to breathe, you put down your Instagram and you go update your LinkedIn or you go update your resume really quickly. Um, Because then every time, you know, at least you have that draft to start with. And then you're just going to be kind of filling in the keywords from the mission statement or the key things that that particular position is looking for. I will say that LinkedIn has a pretty good algorithm. And a lot of the things that come my way, I don't seek them out. They get recommended to me from LinkedIn. Um, And I do like that about it. Uh, 
one other thing I will say is I, you would not know this, but I'm very introverted. I've always been an introvert and it is extremely difficult for me to go up to somebody and start a conversation. LinkedIn gives me the ability to get rid of that nerve. So I, in all honesty, if I didn't know Brandon from LinkedIn, I probably would not have gone up to him in a room of hundreds of people and said, Hey, I'm so-and-so I'd like to meet you. But because we had that connection, I felt comfortable. Then we were excited to see each other. I was so happy to see him. And then, and then that turned into, well, Hey, I want you to meet this person. Oh, Hey, while we're here, I think that now that I know this about LinkedIn or, you know, I learned something about his interests on LinkedIn. Oh, you know what? My friend is really interested in that too. Let me connect you two. So, um, in, in a, that is how it serves me probably best is starting off conversations that I'm not good at starting off on my own. It's much easier for me to type. It's much easier for me to prevent present virtually than it is in person. So little things like that um, can also help you and don't let it intimidate you. Let it serve you the way you want it to serve you. He also made a great point there. That's good. And I think a couple of themes just to kind of encapsulate, I think what you both are saying is LinkedIn is great for leveraging um, your playing field. And what's great is not everyone comes with the same amount of resources, the same type of network. Maybe you don't have the goal or the cousin who's already in the field and you don't have that direct access to what's going on or even opportunities. And so this is a really great way, whether you have those connections or not, you could build them. Whether you're outgoing or not, you could go at your pace, but still connect. And I think that's one of my favorite parts about LinkedIn. But then you also position yourself really well, right? And if you're consistent in that way, what you're doing is once you're ready to really apply for a job, it's just a matter of updating those little things and then applying versus where someone, maybe they wait until they're applying for a job to then build their LinkedIn. You're already so much further ahead. And, I, and you, will, you do want to think about that, right? You want to think about who else is on LinkedIn. There's millions of people. But again, remember that percentage who are on it every day. And it doesn't mean all day, every day, but it does mean they're consistent. And so that's a lot of times where the power really comes from. And I would say this is how I treat my LinkedIn. So I get to work or I start working in the morning. I pull up my computer. I pull up my email and I pull up my LinkedIn. And I just do kind of a quick and I keep the tab open if I'm doing stuff that I can move back and forth from. Or again, it stops me from picking up my phone and doing something that doesn't serve me. So, um, you know, adding it to adding it to your phone is a great way because then you can get push notifications. So if somebody sends you a message, um, it's also just a good thing to kind of add into your routine. You know, you check your student email to make sure that there's nothing pressing. You check Blackboard, you check LinkedIn, you know, and just kind of add it to that. Yeah. And Michelle, I know you wanted to mention the library card. Can you go ahead and explain that to everyone? Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to mention um, LinkedIn also has a huge amount of online webinars that are free access and they go through lots of different strategies, how to use their site and all the different you know, connecting strategies and um, they're experts from LinkedIn, not their headquarters doing that live. Uh, they have some replays you can watch as well. And then also they offer a huge amount of LinkedIn learning courses that is like a separate thing that they offer. Um, which is usually a paid access, but what I've found, I don't, at least my public library here in Northern California through my library card, if you go through that website and log in with the library card, you can have access to LinkedIn learning classes for free. So that might be, I'm not sure about your libraries, but something to check into. And um, you can put, if you complete a certification, it will actually come and actually post on uh, under the either, I think the certification section and many of these other online learning platforms like Coursera and Allison. And like, there's a ton of these online educational sites that LinkedIn connects with um, and will post your official certification online. Same with the ARDMS, same with probably ARRT, like the certifications will connect into LinkedIn and show the official symbol 
Um, so there's like an authentication and that the person will know that you're officially certified under through that agency. So just wanted to put that in there. Yeah, thank you. And then I see we have a question. Um, would you advise creating a LinkedIn as soon as possible, even if your resume is a work in progress, not ready? Absolutely. And again, you, you put into it what you want to get out of it. The very simple things are make sure you've got a good headshot. So a lot of career centers will offer free headshots. Um, Michelle was sharing with us that the library system also had a free headshot offer. Um, so those are easy to get. I will say that iPhones are great. Yes. <laughs> and you can stage a good headshot without Absolutely. being a photographer. That is the benefit of these new phones. Um, so your headshot, you've got a good cover image, like something to do with medical imaging or whatever you're passionate about and your about section. Start with that because then at least that's your footing. And again, like baby steps, do it when you have time. Maybe you take 10 minutes a day over five days in the week. And then at the end, you've got an hour. That's plenty of time to have built a, a good LinkedIn profile. There we are. And, and if I could jump in, like, and then tap into somebody that you see that's doing something that you would like to do something similar or you think they have a developed page and then and you let them help. They can help support or even mentor. We want to use that word as you build it. There's not an expectation for you to come out swinging as a champion. Like give yourself some grace, understand what their progress looks like. And, and, and shoot, for, that's just, that's my opinion. Shoot for it. Absolutely. And you know, mentors can be official. It could be this big official mentoring thing, or it can be totally unofficial. So Dr. Clark, like Brandon was talking about, I did a talk at a symposium a few years ago and he had done the keynote and he mentioned my talk in one of his. And so I said, oh, that's my in, you know, mm -hmm. like he noticed something in my, I talked about research, not a lot of techs do research. I'm super passionate about it. So I talked about it. He happens to love research. And now we all kind of go, Brandon is spot on. It's a small community when you get real active. I mean, it's the same 300 people that kind of do, mm. that run the show. And Kevin happens to be one of them. So every time we're at a conference, I reach out to him. So he's not my official mentor, but I will say every time he does a talk, I go and listen if I can, if I can hear it because I enjoy what he's doing. I admire the path mm. that he's taken. And so, you know, when I try to model myself after that, I naturally kind of use things that he unofficially taught me. Mm -hmm. So um, just know that mentors can be in a lot of different ways. Mentors could be admiring what somebody's doing on LinkedIn, you know, and then modeling after that. That is a mentorship, even though it's not official. Mm -hmm. That's good. I guess I would open it up. Just any last minute questions that anybody would like us to answer before we let you go, hopefully fall asleep. Oh my gosh, my cat. My cat is never downstairs. And here oh, really? she is. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, I love how everyone just smiled. That's my girl. Um, I know there's a way to put like open for work mm. over your picture. And I know there's a big stat that uh, LinkedIn has said that really draws attention uh, for people to actually mm -hmm. find you and approach you with a job offer. Yeah. So that's another option that I've heard is really a useful and simple thing you can do if you are open for work after you're graduating or whatever, just put that little, it's a little um, graphic image that goes to your profile. Uh, and I have to do that soon. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really great point. And I think that's one thing I love about LinkedIn because I think there traditionally is this taboo of sharing openly that you're looking for work and you only post when you get the job. And I think LinkedIn is doing a really good job kind of setting new norms in that to say, hey, we want to know, like recruiters are saying, we want to know when you're open to work, you're helping us, we want to help you. And so there's this really great opportunity to build that, those mutual um, relationships in that way. And so, well, that's one of my favorite things is people who have been transparent, right? Like, Hey, I just lost my job. I, I, I would love to know if there's any work in this area and people comment. I mean, I see that and people are so supportive on LinkedIn. So 
that's a really good point. It, it could be as easy as just putting on, you know, that, that image um, and, and knowing, you know, if you're not familiar with LinkedIn, no, that's really normal to be able to share, hey, I'm open to work. I and the other help. question, um, there's different settings you can have your profile on. So do you recommend keeping it completely 100% so anyone can see what you have? Yeah. Or do you recommend having it somewhat private where you would have to connect with the person? Yeah, I mean, I do warn against being too private just because then it becomes counterproductive, right? LinkedIn is to connect. Um, now, I'm not saying be an open door, let anyone and everyone connect. Um, you know, you still want to be targeted in that way, but I would let the connecting ability be kind of the, um, the boundary so that you can then sift through who you want to be in your network. Um, so know that you can really own that. I don't want you to hear us say to get to 600, um, even if you don't want it, accept everyone, right? You can still be choosy and still get a good number of connections, but it always goes back to what is your goal? If you're trying to be an influencer, then maybe you want to keep that door a little bit wider open, right? Because you're aiming for a greater number of connections. But I would always, um, you know, try to aim for about three, 300 to 500. Don't be too private or else you're going to have a really hard time connecting. Um, so at least allow, allow the My Network tab do that job. What will happen is it'll show um, who's requesting to connect to you. And my this is my own personal practice. So, so this isn't standard. But if I recognize the person, maybe I went to school with them, maybe they were at a conference, maybe um, they're doing the exact same thing I'm doing just at a different location. And I could, I could see and prove they're a legitimate person. <laughs> I will accept them. That's my own personal protocol. So what you all need to do is build your protocol. And that's actually really helpful when you're getting blasted with connections because you can maybe get a little overwhelmed. But if you already know, okay, this person checks the boxes that I'm looking for. I'm gonna accept them, right? Um, so kind of identify again, look at maybe the people that you're wanting to model your um, profile after. You can even ask, hey, how do you go through the people that request your connect? Or how do you choose who you're going to connect to? So um, being somewhat private is okay, but remember the goal is to really connect so you need to be at some point public. I would recommend having your headshot shown. That is one thing I would recommend because Washington does have the ability to block out bots and false profiles. It's not perfect. And so a lot of times some of people's protocols is if I can't see your face and I can't even see your profile, I'm going to be less likely to accept you. So keep that in mind too. Yeah, that's a great point. Great. And do you recommend? I would say like, sorry, I would say like my protocol is um, if they attended the same thing as me. So if we were at a conference together and maybe I don't know them or connected with them there, but they add me, I will usually add them back. I'm usually opening up that page. I'm looking at what industry they're in. So my husband's in the risk industry and we do some collaboration. So I do have a lot of like risk partners that I wouldn't normally have. Um, but most everything else is something I'm interested in. It's either something I'm passionate about something I'm working in or something that has to do with what I'm doing. I do not add everybody at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't feel, I also don't feel obligated to either because it's very, it can be as personal or as impersonal as you want it to be. Yeah. So I do like it in that way. Um, and, and again, if that connection comes with a message, I'm more likely to connect with them. Mm -hmm. And I think it's notable to think about how large your network is. So but with me, because I'm working for the ASRT, there's certain, my, my net may be a little broader. So that number sounds large, but you have to think about it also in the scale in which you're performing. And so it matters. Exactly. And then when somebody's creepy, don't be, don't be <laughs> uh, reserved to disconnect. I don't mind disconnecting. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I've had some disconnections. And again, and, and so that's another thing. Um, so where I work now, our leadership was very open with, you know, we've already investigated all of your social media before we ever hire you. 
And there are ways to do that. So if you're connected with somebody who's controversial on LinkedIn, that could reflect poorly on you. So if somebody starts to do um, posts that are extreme or just something that really, really doesn't sit well with me, I will absolutely disconnect with them. And I just kind of evaluate it. I'm like, is this a LinkedIn connection that I just connected with and I never talked to? Or is this somebody like I really care about? But yeah, Brandon's Brandon hit that spot on. You can disconnect from anybody because I've, you know, I've made connections with somebody because they were in the field, but never really knew them. And then they started posting something maybe majorly political or just something that I didn't want to be associated with. Um, then I just disconnected. Mm-hmm. It's kind of easy. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And it's helpful. That's a professional profile too. You know, it, that's okay to do. Awesome. Thank you guys. I think I don't want it's a 